Welcome to this virtual lecture on the integument system and mechanisms of thermoregulation. Maybe just as a matter of introduction, um, when we talk about the integument system, we are referring to a number of things. Primarily, we are referring to the skin and its derivatives. Now, when you're talking about the derivatives of skin, we're referring to those things which are attached to the, uh, to the skin. They include hair, nails, sweat glands, and the sebaceous glands. So that is part of the integument system. However, the integument system is not just limited to the skin and its derivatives or what we call appendages. When you talk about the integument system, you're also referring to the subcutaneous tissue, which is, which is largely adipose tissue, the fat beneath the skin, and the associated deep fascia, which usually is beneath that fatty layer, separating the fat from the underlying uh, skeletal musculature. Also included in the integument system are the mucocutaneous junctions. These are junctions around the openings on body orifices. For example, the junction between your skin and the inner lining of the lips, the junction between your skin and the inner lining of the endocanal. Those are mucocutaneous junctions. Last but not least, when you talk about the integument system, we're also referring to the breast. Uh, we are talking about here both the male as well as the female breast. Now, take note that uh, the skin itself is actually a self-renewing interface between the body and the environment. And because it's an interface between the body and the environment, it's a major site of intercommunication between the two. The two here refers to the body and the environment. So the skin here is a very important interface between the environment outside and the internal body organs. The surface area of the skin will definitely vary depending on the size of an individual. So of course, if you're high, if you're tall, and uh, perhaps if you have uh, some more weight than another person, then we expect that your surface area is definitely more. However, if you take into consideration these factors, we take the surface area of the skin to be about 8% of the total body mass of an individual. The thickness of the skin also varies. And this will depend on a number of things. It will depend on how mature that region the skin is. It will depend on the age of the individual. It will also depend on some regional specializations. For example, the skin of your palm is definitely different in thickness compared to the skin of the scrotum, for example, for those who have it. So depend. it will also be different from the thickness of the skin of the eyelids, for example. So the thickness will vary depending on regional specializations, aging, as well as maturation. We know that the skin covers actually the entire surface of the body. And this also includes even the outer side of the eardrum. Also the outer ear, what I mean is the external auditory meters. And also the nose, those orifices that enter into the nose, they're called the nostrils. And just behind the nose is what you call the nasal vestibule. The skin still covers those regions. The skin also fuses with the conjunctiva at the margins of the eyelids. So the conjunctiva is that uh, membrane, usually transparent, that line the inner side of the eyelid as well as the outer side of the eyeball. The skin fuses with the conjunctiva. It also fuses with the, the canals that drain the tears from the eyes. We call them the lacrimal canalicula and the lacrimal puncta. At uh, junctions that uh, we've already talked about, 
the skin blends with the mucous membranes and these regions of blending is what we call the mucogitinous junctions. So they're present in orifices entering the alimentary canal, like in the mouth, as well as the anal canal. You also find them in the orifice of the respiratory system, like in the nose, and orifices of the urogenital tract, for example, in the urethra. The skin has a number of functions. Top on the list, we can talk about it being a protective barrier. We know that the skin protects against many things. For example, the skin protects us against uh, infections by microorganisms. It forms an anatomical barrier to microorganisms. That's why if there's a wound, for example, then you'd be more prone to getting infections because it means that uh, the protective mechanism has been breached. And so the microorganism can easily penetrate and enter. Other than protecting us against microorganisms, the skin also protect against mechanical injury. There are some forces, abrasion forces that rub on your skin, but they don't necessarily injure the internal organs because now the skin protect the internal organs from those mechanical damages. It also protect from chemical stress or chemical damage. Think about some acid spilling onto your body, something like that. Some chemical irritant on your skin, on your body. Because of the presence of the skin, the internal organs are protected from those chemical injuries. Thermal stresses are also important to note that uh, skin is able to uh, hold or buff a lot of heat that enters it from the outside, either through radiation or convention, whatever mechanism that heat comes uh, to the body, the body tissues are not directly exposed to that heat because the skin is able to protect against that. And this also includes ultraviolet radiation that may sometimes actually be harmful. The skin has ways of protecting against that. And in particular, this is the role of the melanin pigment on the skin. Other than being a protective barrier, the skin is also a major sensory organ. We call an organ a sensory organ if that organ houses sensory receptors. And we know that the skin has several nerve terminals which are responsible for relaying information regarding various sensations from the skin. We have receptors for touch, receptors for pain, receptors for temperature, which are distributed all over the skin. And so because of this, the skin is a major sensory organ. The skin also have excretory functions. And this largely through sweat, that uh, the sweat that is produced from the skin is not just purely water. It also has some urea and perhaps other waste product as well. So through this, the skin is able to excrete some waste products from the body. This particularly become very significant uh, when it's very um, hot. We know that uh, when it's very hot, uh, there's a lot of sweating that occurs from the skin. I'll be talking much about that under thermoregulatory mechanisms. And because of that sweating, now we urinate less. And when it's very cold, because now you're not losing a lot of this waste products through sweat, now our urine output becomes more. This excretory function can be really manifested clinically if somebody has a chronic renal disease, so they're not able to excrete substances, for example, urea effectively from the kidney, what happens that now there's a lot of urea that accumulates in the body and we only rely on skin perhaps to excrete these ones if the patient is not undergoing dialysis, for example. So with that, there'll be a lot of excretion of urea on the skin surface, which tend also to crystallize. 
and becomes very pathognomonic for somebody who has chronic renal disease. We call that uremic frost. Thermoregulatory functions are very important functions of the skin. The skin is involved in various mechanisms that promote heat loss when the body temperature is very high and mechanisms that promote heat conservation when the body temperature is low. And uh, in the lecture on thermoregulation, we'll be particularly looking at those mechanisms in great detail. But in a nutshell, mechanisms that promote heat loss will include things like increased sweating, falling of hair, and uh, cutaneous vasodilation. And mechanisms that promote heat conservation will include piloerection, which means the standing of the hair follicles, also includes cutaneous vasoconstriction and uh, reduced sweating. Other than those functions you listed, the skin also has biochemical synthetic functions. Uh, I, what I mean here is that it is involved in synthesis of some chemicals, and in particular, the skin is involved in the formation of vitamin D. The precursors of vitamin D come from the skin, then perhaps move to the bloodstream to the liver where they undergo some metabolism again. Other than vitamin D metabolism, um, there are some growth factors which are also produced from skin and perhaps they promote healing the skin as well. We can talk about psychosexual communications as also another function of skin. This is largely based on the fact that, and especially the facial skin, which is involved in display of a number of emotional states. Uh, for example, by wrinkling of the skin and things like that, we are able to express various degrees of emotional states from the skin. So these are some of the key functions of the skin. Now, in the lecture of skin and uh, mechanisms of thermoregulation or the lecture of integument system and mechanisms of thermoregulation, I particularly prefer giving this lecture in three parts. The first part, we just talk about microscopic organization of the skin and its appendages. And that is the focus of this particular lecture that we are listening to right now. However, the second part of this lecture series would include behavioral mechanisms and physiological mechanisms of thermoregulation. Again, more of physiology discussing mechanisms of thermoregulation. And then the third part of the lecture will focus on development and congenital malformations of the skin and its appendages. So this is largely embryology of the integument system. I prefer dividing it into these three parts for the sake of uh, palatability. So for this particular lecture, we are going to focus on only the first part, microscopic organization of the skin and its appendages. Maybe just to begin, human skin is very elastic. You can stretch it to some limits, but you can also compress it to some limits. Of course, you can't compress it fully, well, neither can you stretch it beyond its limits. So it can only be within limits. The outer surface of the skin, when you look at it keenly, and I'm sure you, you know this, that there'll be some tiny markings, we call them skin lines. Some of them are large and very conspicuous, you can easily see them. Others tend to be more microscopic and you perhaps you need a microscope to appreciate them well. But they're still skin lines. The color of the skin is also there and it varies. Uh, skin color is dependent on a number of factors, but more importantly, the activity of melanocytes and we're going to see which other factors also contribute to skin color. In overall, 
the appearance of the skin is affected by many things. For example, the amount of blood flow into the skin, it could be the whole skin or just a particular area, will affect the skin color. The degree of keratinization, formation of keratin around a particular region of the skin will affect how that skin appears, whether rough, smooth, particular color. Also, the presence of hair on a particular region of the skin will determine how that skin looks like. Think about the skin of your scalp, compare the skin of your scalp, of, 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 of the forearm, for example. The presence of glands also affects how the skin appears. Some regions have more conspicuous glands, and so it will have a different appearance compared to other regions which do not have the glands. Uh, physiological states like pregnancy also affect how the skin looks like. Uh, you, you perhaps have seen somebody who is expectant and you see some skin changes in them. And also the general state of health. Somebody who is sick might have a particular appearance of the skin that you're able to tell that this person is not okay, really, when you compare that with somebody who is healthy. So what do we need to learn in this particular lecture? We are going to look at the general structure and classification of skin. After that, we are going to describe the structure organization of the epidermis. We'll also highlight on the different cell types which are present on the epidermis. After that, we are going to talk about the normal pigmentation of skin. And in particular, we'll talk about some basic concepts about melanocyte physiology. Melanocytes are the cells that produce melanin pigment. Beyond that, we'll then look into the dermis as well as the hy hypodermis, particularly talking about the structure and uh, functions of the two. We'll finish this lecture by focusing on some selected cutaneous structures and the cutaneous structures we are going to talk about are the cutaneous sensory receptors. We'll also talk about the sweat glands. We'll talk about the paleosebaceous units and we'll talk about the mammary gland. Let's begin with the general structure of skin as well as the classification of skin. Now, we consider the skin to be made up of two major layers. We have a top layer, which is called the epidermis. So the skin consists of two major layers, the epidermis, which is an epithelial layer, and the dermis, which is a fibrous connective tissue layer. This image shows you the epidermis, which is this one and the dermis, which is the underlying one. So these are the two major layers of the skin. The junction between the dermis and the epidermis is termed the dermal epidermal junction. The dermal epidermal junction is highly convoluted, as we can see. Follow that line, and this is the dermal epidermal junction. So it is highly convoluted. These convolutions create some interlocking, as you can see, between the epidermis on top and the dermis below. This interlocking interface is very important in providing integrity to the two layers so that it's not easily they are not easily separable. Because there are interlockings, it means that we have some extensions of the dermis into the epidermis. The extensions of the dermis into the epidermis, like this one and that one, are termed dermal papillae. You can call them the retiridges. Similarly, the extensions of the epidermis into the dermis, like this one, are called epidermal pegs or the rete pegs. You can call them rete pegs or epidermal pegs. So the epidermal pegs or the epidermal ridges 
interlock with the dermal papillae so that we have some strength. The epidermis and the dermis are well anchored together. Below the dermis is a layer we call the hypodermis. In principle, the hypodermis is not part of the skin. It is actually considered subcutaneous, which means below the skin. This hypodermis is predominantly consisting of adipose tissue, which means fatty tissue. And in gross anatomy, this is what we consider as superficial fascia. It is not part of the skin, but it is definitely part of the integument system from the introduction I gave you a few minutes ago. How do we classify skin? Before we understand how skin is classified, perhaps it's important for you to understand that different parts of the body may vary in how the skin look like. So that the skin of different parts of the body vary a lot in thickness. You know, some body regions that have thick skin, like your palm, compared to some regions like the eyelids, which are very thin one, in terms of the gross thickness of the skin. The skin may also vary in terms of its mechanical strength. There's some skin regions which are a bit delicate and I'm sure you have in mind some in right now. There's some skin regions which have high mechanical strength. There's some skin regions which appear really, really soft. The skin is really, really soft. When others, others appear like they're very rough, some skin regions appear more flexible compared and sagging compared to others. Some skin regions have a lot of keratinization. The keratin is very thick compared to others. Some skin regions have a lot of hair. And even the, 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 the size of the hair also varies. So you might find the very long hair in this region, like in the scalp compared to the rest of the, some parts of the body which may have very short hair or no hair at all. Also the presence of glands vary. Some regions have a lot of sweat glands, some regions have fewer sweat glands, some regions have a lot of sebaceous glands. Some regions do not have a lot of sebaceous glands. Of course, pigmentation also varies, so obvious uh, vascularity varies and innervation also varies. So in principle, there are a lot of things that vary between the skin of one region and another within the same person. However, we have two classes of skin and these two classes of skin is largely based on the thickness of the epidermis. Thickness of the epidermis. Now, remember, it is not thickness of the whole skin but thickness of the epidermal layer only. Based on this, we have what we call thin skin. Thin skin is also the, the hazard skin, the skin with the hair. This thin skin is the one that covers the greater part of the body. So it's basically the skin that has hair like this one. You can see this, this is hair. So the skin that has hair is what we call thin skin, irrespective of the total thickness of that skin, we call them thin skin. And this is contrasted with what we call thick skin. Thick skin is the hairless type of skin. We also call it glabrous skin. This is the skin that does not have hair. Now, where do you find such skin? We find this skin in the palm of the hands and in the sole of the feet. That's where we find them. Again, remember, it's based on the fact that there's no hair and that there is hair on the other one. And this is largely based on the thickness of the epidermis. So the ones which have thick epidermis do not have hair. And the ones which have thin epidermis have hair. 
this image here shows you now the skin that does not have hair. So this is the thick type of skin. Compare that with this one, which is the skin that has hair. This is a thin type of skin. Now this one is a thick type of skin. Okay, I want to show you histological slides of uh, the thin skin and the thick skin. So these are lower magnification of the skin. And why do we think this is skin? Look at the fact that you can see two layers, one epithelial and one connective tissue layer. The epithelial layer is a characteristic type of epithelium, which is uh, basically stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, very unique to the skin. And so we know this is epidermis and the underlying connective tissue is the dermis. Now, this thing here is the hair follicle. The hair follicle is a part of the hair that enters into this, is buried deep into the skin. So we can see that's a hair follicle. Perhaps at a higher modification, we're able to appreciate that one. So the skin that has hair follicle is a thin type of skin. We can compare that with the glabrous skin. So the glabrous skin, again, we appreciate this skin because this is uh, the epidermis, stratified squamous, keratinized epithelium, and uh, beneath it, the dermis, which is a connective tissue layer. At this magnification, we can see very thick, very, very thick layer of keratin on top of the cellular zone of the epidermis. Perhaps a high magnification will reveal that better very thick layer of keratin on top of the cellular epidermis. So this makes this epidermis be very thick. We call glabra skin. This type of skin does not have a hair follicle. As you can see, there's no hair follicle. What you're seeing here, these are sweat glands just traversing. So that's the first agenda, the general structure of the skin and how we classify skin. So we've learned that uh, we have epidermis and the dermis in principle. On the classification, we base it on the structure of the epidermis into thick and thin. Now let's talk about the epidermis at greater length. The epidermis is a compound tissue really consisting mainly of a layer of stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. So this is the layer of stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. Remember how we classify epithelium. We call epithelium stratified because the number of cell layers are more than one. As you can see here, you can see many cells. So more than one cell layer. We call it squamous because the cells on the apical zone are flattened, they're squamous. So it's stratified squamous epithelium. Whenever you have stratified squamous epithelium, it tells you that uh, you are dealing with epithelium that is subjected to a lot of abrasion forces. And based on that, stratified squamous epithelia usually are of different varieties, depending again on the degree of abrasion forces that they experience. You can have stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium, stratified squamous para-keratinized epithelium, and stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. The one of the skin experiences the most of the abrasion forces, and therefore it's the one that is truly keratinized, and this is the thick layer of keratin you are seeing. This is an example of glabra skin, just to demonstrate to you the thick layer of dead material called keratin. So epidermis is a stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. The cell types within this epidermis are of a variety. 
but keratinocytes are the principal cell types here. There are many others, and we're going to see them shortly, but keratinocytes are the major cell types here, and they exist in all the zones of the epidermis. Based on the maturity of the keratinocytes within the epidermis, we have different layers of the epidermis. We call them epidermal strata. So this is based on the degree of maturity of the epidermis, or rather degree of maturity of the keratinocytes. And we are going to talk about this strata shortly. Before we talk about the strata, let's try to understand why the epidermis is actually adapted to withstand abrasion forces. What makes it be adapted to withstand abrasion forces? One is the fact that it is keratinized. Now we are going to explain the process of conification, the process of keratinization shortly. But at this point in time, I want you to understand that this epithelium is covered by a top layer. The top layer here is a layer of dead material, the layer of keratin that help to protect the body against physical injury. So there's a dead material on top of the cellular layer which protect against injury. That is conification or keratinization. So that conified layer help to prevent injury. The concept of stratification is also important. The fact that uh, the epidermis consists of multiple layers of cells from superficial to deep. So the superficial cells are the ones which are more exposed. The deeper cells are not as exposed. If there's something that causes a abrasion on the skin, it will peel off the superficial cells first and uh, perhaps spare the deeper cells. This image captures for you the stratification I'm talking about, look at the number of cell layers there from the top all the way to the bottom. Quite many, you can just say innumerable, although we, if you're keen, you can actually count them. So the ones deeper are more protected compared to the ones superficial, which are more exposed. And in this image, you can also appreciate that the ones which are superficial are actually flattened, they're squamous, and that's why we call this one stratified squamous epithelium with keratin. We have what we call desmosomes. Desmosomes are at their injunctions, which exist between adjacent keratinocytes within the epidermis. So these are their injunctions tend to hold adjacent cells together tightly. And so these also help in preventing again a separation of cells, which is an important thing. If it's going to prevent against abrasion. Hemidesmosomes are at their injunctions, which help to anchor the basal cells of the epidermis to the underlying basal lamina. So this also helps to hold them to the underlying basal lamina. Last but not least, the concept of continuous renewal is also very important to know that the cells on the basal side of the epidermis are continuously being renewed. They are highly mitotic. And so as they divide, the cells migrate from deeper zones to superficial zones. So that even if you peel off or the superficial cells are disquamated, the underlying deeper cells will soon replace them. So this continuous renewal is also an important thing to consider when you're looking at adaptations of epidermis to withstand abrasion forces. Now we can talk about the layers of the epidermis. We can call them the epidermal strata. The keratinocytes of the epidermis exist in different layers. So this 
strata of the epidermis are largely determined by the degree of maturity of the keratinocytes in these zones. For some reasons, we prefer to name the layers from deep coming superficial, nothing magical about it, just uh, more conventional that way. And so we'll keep to that script. We are going to talk about five layers generally. The first three deeper layers are metabolically active. The cells are metabolically active. But the last two superficial layers are not metabolically active. So starting from the deepest layer, the one labeled there as SB, it stands for stratum basale. It means the basal layer. The basal layer is a layer of one layer of cuboidal to columnar cells. The cells in this layer are highly mitotic, actually. They have a high uh, mitotic potential. So they're the ones that actually function as the stem cells for the rest of the cells of the epidermis. We can also call this layer the stratum germinativum. Then we go to the second layer written there, SS, stratum spinosum. Stratum spinosum is the largest cellular layer. The cells in this zone are perhaps polygonal and have some spinous extensions. There are some cellular extensions. And that is why we call it stratum spinosum or the precocell layers. The cells in this zone also have some degree of mitotic potential. Although the cells do not divide as fast as the cells on the basal layer, because of the volume of cells within here, the contribution of stratum spinosum is still important in regeneration and continuous renewal because of the volume. So this would be the stratum basale, the basal layer, then the whole of this zone here, this is the stratum spinosum, the cellular layer. Then we have this layer here. This layer consisting of flattened cells, as you can see, they are flattened and they seem to have some granules within them. We call this one stratum granulosum or the granular layer. The keratinocytes in this layer have some granules within them. We call them keratohyaline granules within them. And so these granules make them have that characteristic appearance. That's why we call them stratum granulosum. Perhaps the last living cellular layer, the cells in that zone are flattened, and that is why we call this epithelium stratified squamous. In this image, you can still see the stratum basale there, then stratum spinosum, then stratum granulosum there. Beyond that, we talk about the clear layer. The clear layer is that one, which we also call stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum is only perceived perhaps in the glabrous type of skin. We do not see it in the thin type of skin. This uh, stratum lucidum is considered to be important in forming a barrier against evaporation. Last but not least, we have the conified layer, or other is known as the stratum conium. So the stratum conium is a layer of dead material, the layer of keratin. It can be very thick as we see here, or sometimes thin, but uh, it's dead material. So remember, this is layer five and layer four, they are not metabolically active there. We don't have living cells in those zones. And then layer one to three are living cells, so they're metabolically active. 
the image to your left shows you the layers of skin and from a glabrous type of skin. The image to your right also shows you the different layers of the epidermis, stratum basali layer, stratum spinosum, some stratum granulosum, and uh, we have stratum corneum there. The stratum lucidum is not well perceived in this one, largely because it's thin skin. Now, due to the continuous renewal of the cells of the epidermis and especially the basal cells, which are continuously dividing, we have a very high turnover of cells. Usually in about seven to 11 weeks, we've replaced the whole epidermis. That's the turnover time. As the keratinocytes move from the basal to superficial layers of the epidermis, they undergo a process of conification. A process of conification is a progressive process which involves changes in the shape, the content, the structure, and metabolism of the keratinocytes. They undergo these changes as they move from the deeper zones, statum basale, to the superficial zones of the epidermis. Now let's break down this conification process. We've talked about change in cellular shape. How do the shape of keratinocytes transform? They transform from, remember in the stratum basale, they are columnar or cuboidal. Then when they go to stratum spinosum, they are polygonal cells. When they move to the stratum granulosum, they are flattened cells. So the transformation here is towards flattening. That is one of the process of qualification. The other one is change in cellular contents. As the cells move from the basal zones towards the superficial zones, they tend to accumulate the intermediate filament, which we find in epithelial cells, and that's keratin. So there's a lot of accumulation of keratin within the cytoplasm of the cells as they move from deeper to superficial zones. That means that the more superficial cells will therefore have a lot of keratin within them compared to the deeper cells, which will not have much of that. The cellular organelles also change as you move from deeper to superficial zones. The keratinocytes, which are in the deeper zones, have definite nuclei with ribosomes and uh, mitochondria being well oriented within them. But as these cells move towards the superficial zones, the nuclei, the ribosomes, and the mitochondria tend to disintegrate. Remember, these cells are moving towards actually apoptosic side, they are moving towards their death. And so there is disintegration of the organelles. Last but not least, uh, in the process of conification, the cells change in their metabolism from being living cells, which are found within the deeper zones, to non-viable cells, which we now see in the conified layer. So that in that conified layer, we don't have living cells there. It's just dead material. That is the process of conification of the epidermis. Now let's look at the structure of the epidermis from these histology slides. When you look at this slide, what comes to your mind first is that this is a slide of skin. And we say that because we can see two layers, one layer of epithelium and the specific epithelium is stratified squamous keratinized epithelium on top of a fibrous connective tissue zone that we'll be talking about shortly that is the dermis. A higher magnification of the epidermis reveals what I've just mentioned confirms that uh, we have a stratified squamous keratinized and perhaps you want to say heavily keratinized epithelium in this particular case. 
this keratinization is the dead material. Now look at the cellular zone. We are still able to appreciate that uh, the cells toward the this surface have uh, a flattened orientation and they also tend to have some granules within them. And perhaps a high multiplication will help us understand that much better. We can see the cells within the stratum granulosum displaying a lot of granules within them, but also their flattened squames, as you can see, they are squamous. So this will be the stratum basale or stratum germinativum, then this is the stratum spinosum or the precocellia, and then this one is the stratum germinativum. So the stratum granulosum, the flattened cells with granules. We can also have a look at uh, thin skin and compare them. So here we just have two slides, but uh, still same concept. We have the epidermis there, stratophytoscumus keratinase epithelium over the fibrous connect tissue zone, the dermis. At higher modification, we confirm the same. It is stratified squamous keratinized epithelium on top of fibrous connective tissue zone. We can now talk about the cell types which are present in the epidermis. There are four major cell types of the epidermis, but I'll give you five. Keratinocytes are the principal cell types of the epidermis. They're the ones that form the protective barrier that we talk about in the epidermis. Uh, through the process of conification, they're the ones that basically release the keratin or contain the keratin within the cytoplasm and the cells die through the process of conification. So that the most abundant of the cell types of the epidermis existing in all zones of the epidermis. The second most abundant cell type of the epidermis are the melanocytes. These are the pigment forming cells of the epidermis. This pigment is important in a number of functions, including protection against UV radiation. Now, important to note is that the melanocytes are located within the stratum germinativum, within the stratum basale. That's where the melanocytes are centered. They might have processes that extend to the other zones, as we can see in this particular image, but their cell bodies are basically centered at the stratum basale. We have the Langerhans cells. The Langerhans cells are antigen presenting cells, cells of bone marrow origin. So basically they are important in defense against infections. They are present within the stratum spinosum, the precocell layer. Merkel cells are also present on the basal layer of the epidermis. The Merkel cells are mechanoreceptor cells as well as cells of the diffuse neuroendocrine system. Now, when you talk about it being a mechanoreceptor cell, it means that it can detect mechanical um, forces. Um, it being a cell of the diffuse neuroendocrine system means that following nervous stimulation, it can release some hormonal substances. The fifth cell type are the ones we call the interpithelial lymphocytes. These are white blood cells. Uh, they are generally migrants, so they may enter the epidermis and perhaps also leave the epidermis, but they are usually there in the epidermis. They are interpithelial lymphocytes. They are part of white blood cells. These are the epidermal cell types. Let's now go to agenda three focusing more on skin pigmentation as we also explain the normal melanocyte physiology. We are aware that the human skin color, this human skin is colored. The human skin color is derived and varies with some things. One, it 
it is derived from the amount of blood flow to it, and it also varies with the amount of blood flow into it because this also affects the degree of oxygenation of this particular skin. And that's why sometimes uh, if in case we can use the skin color to know if somebody is actually uh, not well oxygenated because the skin will appear bluish. And that's what we mean by cyanosis. Well, we commonly see cyanosis in the mucous membranes as opposed to skin itself, but you can also notice it on the skin, especially when it's extreme and the person is not dark. Um, skin color is also dependent on the thickness of the stratum corneum. So the ones which are very thick stratum corneum perhaps will appear a different color compared to the ones which are very thin stratum corneum. But importantly, skin color is also dependent on the activity of the melanocytes. These are the cells that produce the melanin pigment. We'll be talking more about how that varies. We know that there's some racial variations in skin color. These racial variations in skin color is not necessarily dependent on the number of melanocytes, but more dependent on the activity of the melanocytes and the type of melanin that they produce, how much they produce it. These racial variations are largely genetically determined. It's not something you want to modify so much. Uh, there's an intrinsic um, degree of melanin pigmentation according to different races. However, that does not mean that uh, once there's a particular skin color that can never change, we have pigmentation changes that can be seen. And uh, from a physiological perspective, they could be induced by radiation, chemicals, or even some hormones, especially the hormones of the reproductive system, estrogen and progesterone, as well as uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Let's talk about melanocyte at greater length. I've already told that melanocyte is a pigment producing cell of the skin and it's located, the cell body is located within the basal layer, stratum germinativum. It however has extensions which go to the surrounding keratinocytes. The number of melanocytes per unit area of skin varies from one region to another could have as few as 800 per millimeter square up to as high as 2300 millimeter square in some regions. So the same individual. The cells have numerous branches. So we'd say they are dendritic cells to mean that they have a lot of processes. These processes or projections are directed to the surrounding keratinocytes which they make functional contact with. For example, look at this extension into that keratinocyte. So a melanocyte has processes that go to the surrounding keratinocytes and it makes functional connections with those fun uh, surrounding keratinocytes. So what happens is that the melanocytes here will be producing melanin pigment this melanin pigment is packaged in some vesicles, and we term these ones as melanosomes, those vesicles that have packaged uh, the melanin pigment. The melanosomes then become transferred to the surrounding keratinocytes, the keratinocytes which have made functional contact with the melanocytes, receive the melanosomes. So that's the whole essence of the dendritic processes and the functional connection with the surrounding keratinocytes so that you can distribute or transfer the pigment that it has formed to the surrounding keratinocytes. And that actually why paradoxically when we stain 
skin, you might see a melanocyte as a very clear cell. Paradoxically, we expect to be the one with a lot of granules because it's the one that produces pigment, pig, pigment but no. Because it produces pigment, which it distributes, it transfers to the surrounding keratinocytes. The surrounding keratinocytes will be seen to have the pigment, but the melanocyte will not be seen to have the pigment. They appear clear. So this image shows you again melanocyte with the surrounding keratinocytes, it being it being dendritic, and this electron micrograph image captures for you the granules which are present within the melanocyte as they're being transferred to the surrounding keratinocytes. Now, a single melanocyte, together with all the keratinocytes that that melanocyte makes functional contact with, constitute what we call the epidermal melanin unit. So an epidermal melanin unit refers to one melanocyte with all the keratinocytes that that melanocyte makes functional contact with. Generally, we'll have a ratio of about one melanocyte to 30 keratinocytes, generally. And uh, the number of melanocytes is relatively constant between one person and another. What varies is the activity of the melanocytes. So whether you're dark or light, uh, perhaps you have the same concentration of the number of melanocytes if you focus on a particular standard region. So what is the function of this melanin pigment? Melanin pigment is important in absorbing the ultraviolet radiation that is coming from the sun, and this helps to protect the DNA against the damage by UV radiation. You know that uh, if it's damaged, it makes the DNA be a bit unstable, and this can lead to a lot of mutations. And these mutations can also be sometimes lead to development of cancer, among other things. So it's important to protect the DNA from the damaging effect of the UV radiation. Melanin also acts as a scavenger for the free radicals that are present around. So melanin binds these free radicals. Even though we are saying that uh, this melanin is important in absorbing uh, UV radiation, if you have a lot of it, you may impair vitamin D synthesis because remember vitamin D synthesis relies on UV radiation to make the precursors of vitamin D. There are uh, two types of melanin pigmentation. We have what we call constitutive pigmentation. This is the type of pigmentation that is genetically determined. And so it's the one that is intrinsic. Every person is born, there'll be a particular level of pigmentation that they'll be having. So that's the constitutive pigmentation, as opposed to the facultative pigmentation, which varies. It is acquired, it is reversible, and it's reduced by a number of factors, radiation, chemicals, or hormones. So this one varies. And uh, if you compare it with the constitutive one, which doesn't vary, that one is genetically determined. Now let's talk about the ratio variations in uh, melanin pigmentation. I've already alluded to something about the ratio variations in melanin pigmentation. I'm told it's largely due to the activity of melanosis. Now let's uh, clarify that further. One of the things that varies among races is the melanocyte cytomorphology. There are some races with larger melanocytes, and I'm not saying the number, it's more about the larger, the size of a single melanocyte compared to other races that have smaller melanocytes. So the darker races are known to have larger melanocytes, and these larger melanocytes also tend to have more dendritic processes. 
then there is a melanocyte activity. Um, when melanocytes produce the melanin, and this melanin is packaged in some vesicles we call the melanosomes, we see uh, the heavily pigmented skin, the darker races, to be having larger melanosomes. And these melanosomes are the melanosomes that have stayed till late. They have late stages of melanosomes. They have not been destroyed earlier. They are persisting until much late. So these larger late stage melanosomes are present in darker skins compared to the light skins. Uh, the rate at which melanosomes are degraded also varies. Now, perhaps you need to understand this, that uh, a melanocyte will produce the melanin. The melanin is packaged into vesicles called melanosomes. Melanosomes then are transferred through the dendritic processes of the melanocytes into the surrounding keratinocytes. The keratinocytes therefore receive the melanosomes and usually the keratinocytes will destroy, degrade the melanosomes within them. So depending on the rate at which the keratinocytes degrade the melanosomes, we can have different skin color. The people with lighter skin are seen to be able to degrade the melanosomes quite faster than people with darker skin. Take note that uh, the number of melanocytes will tend to decrease as we grow older. And uh, they also tend to be absent in gray white hair. Also take note that uh, in the condition we call albinism, there's an enzyme that is usually important in melanin synthesis, and that enzyme could either be absent or inactive, we call it tyrosinase enzyme. How do melanocytes respond to UV radiation? Now, melanocytes respond to UV radiation by tanning, and this basically means uh, pigment darkening. There are two types of pigment darkening, there are two types of tanning. There's the immediate tanning, which means that uh, the moment somebody is exposed to UV radiation, the melanin within them turn darker within a few minutes. This darkening of melanin is largely due to photooxidation of the pre-existing melanin pigment. So the moment UV radiation hits onto this pigment, the pigment undergoes photooxidation and may appear darker. But there's another type of tanning, another type of pigment darkening. This is what we call delayed tanning. Delayed tanning occurs from perhaps 48 hours onwards and it involves a number of mechanisms. One is that uh, within those 48 hours onwards, the UV radiation may stimulate melanogenesis within the melanocyte. So more melanin is being produced in simple terms. Also within those 24, sorry, 20, 48 hours or more, because of exposure to UV radiation, there'll be transfer of additional melanosomes to the surrounding keratinocytes. So if there's some melanosomes that have already been produced because of UV radiation, the melanosomes will be transferred faster. Last but not least, uh, there is also a possibility that some melanocytes could have been dormant, but when they are exposed to UV radiation, they become active. So there's an activation of dormant melanocytes. This will also cause darkening, tanning, basically. Now, the activation of dormant melanocytes would make this dormant melanocyte to increase in their size and perhaps also in the apparent number to mean that not necessarily through mitosis, but that uh, if you had um, um, only five active melanocytes, if you and perhaps 20 inactive one, 
if you have the skin exposed to UV radiation, perhaps you now have 15 active melanocytes and perhaps just 10 inactive ones. So we are talking about the apparent number of the active melanocytes being increased and also the fact that uh, the size of an active melanocyte is also increased through this activation. So this is what happened as people darken beyond two days after exposure to UV radiation. So with that extensive explanation of uh, normal skin pigmentation and melanocyte physiology, that will mark the end of the talk on epidermis. We can now talk about the dermis itself. The dermis is a fibrous connective tissue layer of the skin. It is found just beneath the epidermis, as I'd already mentioned earlier. The main role of this particular layer is to provide strength to the, epi to the skin. So it primarily confers strength to skin. In terms of its histology, I've already said it's fibrous connective tissue. So it has a lot of fibers and especially collagenous fibers. These collagenous fibers run in different directions. The matrix of this particular layer consists of largely collagen type one, which is the most abundant type of collagen in the body, and collagen type three, which we call reticular fibers. So these collagen types, are a lot in the skin and especially collagen type one followed by collagen type three. But we also have elastic fibers within the dermis and this is what enables the dermis therefore to be elastic. You can stretch it and it goes back. This image captures for you the different fibers which are present within the dermis of the skin. So the green is largely collagenous fibers, but there are a few um, elastic fibers within this particular region. You can see them. The fiber density of the dermis varies depending again on the region of the body. So some regions have a lot of fiber density compared to other regions. It also varies depending on the age of the individual. So as we grow older, the number of fibers within the dam is changed compared to a young individual. It also varies depending on sex. Uh, the males will have a different fiber density compared to females. The dam is also houses a number of sensory receptors so we have a lot of receptors within the dermis also within the dermis we have a lot of nerve terminals we have several blood vessels within the dermis we have lymphatic channels within the dermis we do have sweat glands sebaceous glands also within the dermis and uh, last but not least we have hair follicles this is the submerged portion of hair we call it hair follicles also present all the way to the dermis. So the dermis is an amalgamation of many things. There are several cells within the dermis, therefore. But the principal cell type of the dermis is the fibroblast, because this is the one that synthesizes the matrix of the dermis. It's the one that lays down the collagenous fibers is the one that lays down the ground substance of the dermis. So it's the main cell type. But because we mentioned that the dermis has a lot of other formed structures, nerves, blood vessels, and the like, we also expect cells of those formed structures also to be present within the dermis. But remember, they are secondary. They are present because of those other tissues they're not the primary cell types of the dermis. There are two parts of the dermis. Uh, this part of the dermis that interlock with the epidermis, the part of the dermis that 
extend into the epidermis is what we call the papillary dermis, or we had just called it a few minutes ago, the dermal papillae. Dermal papilla consists of loose connective tissue. This dermal papilla are of two varieties, or two varieties have been described. There are those ones which we call vascular dermis, and there are those ones that we call sensory dermis. In particular, the sensory type of papillary dermis are the papillary dermis that contain mesnas corpuscles. Mesnas corpuscles are receptors for light touch found on the skin. Then the others largely containing plexus of capillaries are termed the vascular dermis. The deeper zones of the dermis, this one, which we call reticular dermis, the reticular dermis consists of dense, irregular connective tissue. Now, not loose connective tissue, but dense and irregular connective tissue. It simply means that the collagenous fibers are a lot, hence dense, and run in different directions, hence irregular. This reticular dermis contain the other structures as well, the other formed elements. Uh, within the skin, like uh, sensory receptors, as well as some glands. We'd mention about hypodermis as uh, this layer of variable fat amount that is located beneath the dermis, we call it hypodermis. So it's usually just a loose connective tissue or variable thickness. The variable thickness is largely dependent on the amount of adipose tissue that is present. Look at this image here. From the top, this is the epidermis, stratified squamous keratinous epithelium, this is the keratin layer. Deep to that, so this skin is not the thick type. As you can see, the keratin layer is not very thick and if anything, it has hair follicles, as you can see here. So it's a thin skin. Beneath the epidermis is this zone here, which you call the dermis. The dermis has a number of things, including the pilosebaceous unit, we're going to talk about them shortly, and the sweat glands there, we're going to talk about them shortly. Beneath the dermis is this zone here, which you call the hypodermis. It's a layer of adipose tissue, which we term superficial fascia. In gross anatomy, remember that the hypodermis varies, again, in thickness between one region and another. For example, the amount of hypodermis within the anterior abdominal wall could be a lot compared to perhaps the amount of the epidermis within the skin of the scrotum, the skin of the face and the like. So this image is a slide of skin. I'd already shown you this, but uh, for now I want us to focus on the dermis. So remember the dermis is dense, it's a fibrous connective tissue zone with the two parts. The dense irregular connective tissue zone is the one you see predominantly here. As below, we see these are the dermal papillae, and this is the reticular dermis. You can see some cell types there. We already talked about them. This also shows you the skin and we can see the epidermis there with some sweat glands opening to the surface. So this is thin skin with very thin layer of keratin layer. Then this is a very thick layer of uh, dermis as you can see and beneath that we see the hypodermis there. A higher magnification on the hypodermis reveal that uh, it's predominantly of adipose tissue makeup. We can see this chicken wire appearance of the adipose tissue with a lot of blood vessels. That's one, that's another one. These are subcutaneous vessels. This one shows you adipose tissue. We can see these cells which appear like they have empty spaces and their nuclei are eccentric, uh, uh, pushed to the edge. It appears like uh, chicken wire. This is the adipose tissue, and that's a blood vessel within the hypodermis. Right, now we can handle the last component of this lecture, which is on 
the organization and role of some selected cutaneous structures. We will talk about the cutaneous sensory receptors, sweat glands, pilosebaceous units, and uh, the mammary gland. I do wish to begin with the cutaneous sensory receptors. So cutaneous sensory receptors are basically sensory receptors which are found on the skin. Remember, a sensory receptor is a specialized neuron or epithelial cell that can detect environmental stimuli. And in principle, what receptors do is that they convert environmental stimuli into nerve impulses, which are termed action potentials. Through this mechanism, these structures, these organic structures are able to detect environmental changes and convey that information through the afferent nerve system to the brain. We have a number of cutaneous sensory receptors because we are saying that the skin is a major sensory organ. I'll give you examples of these cutaneous sensory receptors. We have the free nerve endings which consists of just dendritic nerve endings that lack connective tissue covering around them. Neither do they have myelin sheath around them. So they're just free ending of the dendrite, perhaps the majority in the skin. They are found almost everywhere on the skin. They're not limited to the skin. However, we also find them in some deeper body tissues that than just skin. But on the skin, we see them terminating largely at the stratum granulosum, as we can see in this particular image. So this is the free nerve endings terminating the stratum granulosum. Free nerve endings are receptors for pain. So they are nociceptors. They can detect pain sensation. They can also detect temperature sensation. So they are thermoreceptors. We have the cold and the hot thermoreceptors or the heat thermoreceptors. Free nerve endings are also receptors for touch as well as receptors for pressure. So they can detect a number of uh, environmental stimuli. The second cutaneous sensory receptor, the maize nascopasals, which consists of many branching nerve terminals within a capsule. So this one is encapsulated. And usually the mesonous corpuscles are found in the dermal papilla, as you can see there. Remember, this is the epidermis, this is the dermis, so this is a dermal papilla or papillary dermis. So we have that encapsulated structure as a capsule. And this is a nerve terminal that is having several branches within that capsule. We find the papillary dermis, as I've said, and particularly a lot within the fingertips and also at the lips. And remember those are regions that can detect uh, light touch. This is how Mesna's corpus will look like histologically. Perhaps you might not be very convinced with that. So the drawing is a better justice than this one. But uh, in principle, you focus on the Papillary dermis, as we have done here, and this look for something that appears to have a capsule. You might be able to just be able to see it better there. Mesnas corpuscles have great sensitivity to movement. So the movement of objects over the skin surface really stimulate them. And for that reason, usually they're able to detect those moving light movement within the skin, as well as low frequency vibration. They detect motion. Markel's discs are the third cell type, the, or rather sensor receptor. They consist of uh, a Markel cell in close opposition with an enlarged nerve terminal. So consider this to be a Merkel cell and this is a nerve terminal terminating onto the Merkel cell. Remember the Merkel cells are present on the epidermis. So like that's a Merkel cell and there's a nerve terminal ending into it. So the whole thing is what we call Merkel's disc. 
these ones are responsible for steady state um, signal that allow one to determine cutaneous contact of objects against the skin surface. So basically, if an object is continuously touching on the skin surface, these receptors are able to pick. They're able to pick sustained uh, contact, continuous contact. For example, if you're seated and you continue to feel what you're seated on over a long period of time, you most likely using now the Merkel's discs as opposed to others which forget about what you've detected very quickly. We, we said they're fast adapting. Uh, the Merkel's discs are slow adapting. They're important in providing information regarding pressure on the body surface, but also in terms of texture of objects that uh, the body is in contact, especially in your hand. So we can use markets to actually tell you that this is actually a phone, that's a cup, that's a book when you hold them, even if the eyes closed. Peritracheal nerve endings are the next type of sensory receptors. They consist of sensory nerve terminals that wrap around the root of hair follicles. So hair follicle is this submerged portion of hair. We have some nerve terminals that go around the hair follicle. So this is what we call the peritracheal nerve endings. So, or you can just say nerve endings around hair follicle, like what you can see there. We also call them the hair end organs or hair follicle receptors. These receptors are sensitive to light movements that occur on the hair follicle. So if there's some slight movement of the hair follicle, they'll be able to de detect those changes very quickly. For that reason, these receptors are important in detecting movement of objects on the skin surface, but they're also sensitive in detecting the initial contact that an object makes on the skin surface. They are very fast adapting. Ruffini terminals are the other sensory receptors on the skin. These are spindle shaped. They usually multi branch and encapsulated nerve endings within that particular spindle. The spindle is kind of elongated. Um, spindle shaped simply means perhaps squamous type of a shape. Uh, this is how it look like in other images. So a lot of branching nerve terminal, but the whole structure is encapsulated and appears like a spindle. We find the Ruffini terminals in deeper parts of the skin, especially in the reticular dermis, but you also find it in some deeper internal tissues and even in joint capsules, really. Uh, Ruffini terminals are important in detecting continuous state of deformation of body tissues, e.g. if there's some prolonged heavy touch or pressure signals, Ruffini terminals is able to detect this one. On the capsule of the joint, Ruffini terminals provide information regarding position of fingers or position of joints. And so they can also function as proprioceptors for that particular reason. Um, there's some information that suggests that Ruffini terminals may also be activated by warmth, sensation, heat. And so they could be functioning as heat receptors as well. We have the Pacinian corpuscles. Pacinian corpuscles are encapsulated. When you cut across them, they appear like this cut onion appearance. So usually we have concentric, concentric connective tissue lamellae around the nerve terminal. This is a nerve terminal there. Then you have concentric uh, connective tissue lamellae around. And then there's a large capsule now overall that covers the whole receptor. These are Pacinian corpuscles. They actually found deeper zones uh, look at that. So this is the nerve terminal that enters through the center. And then these are the concentric lamellae of connective tissue. And eventually we have the capsule on the outside. We find Pacinian corpuscles in the deeper zones of the skin, as well as 
in the fascial tissues of the body. So you find them even deeper than skin itself. Uh, that's what it looks like. So this is the nerve terminal, and these are the concentric lamellae, and we'll expect the connect tissue capsule to be outside there. These receptors are usually stimulated by rapid local compressions on the body tissues, and for that reason, person and corpuscles are able to detect vibration or other rapid pressure changes that affect body tissues. Lastly, we have the Krauss end bulb. The Krauss end bulb is located also within the reticular dermis. They are cylindrical in shape, but they could also be ovoid. They are encapsulated and they contain some soft semi-fluid core. The core of Krauss end bulb contains semi-fluid material. The actual role of the Krauss end bulb is actually not very clear, but there are some suggestions to think that uh, the Krauss end bulb could be functioning as cold receptors, especially this because they seem to be stimulated by cold uh, stimuli. They are found around the conjunctiva of the eye. We find them on the lips. So remember, those are mucocutaneous junctions, but you also find them in the tongue the glands penis and the glands clitoris. So this is a summary of the different cutaneous sensory receptors that we have talked about. The one in the middle there is for the glabrous type of skin and the one to your right is for the thin type of skin. We've already talked about all those cutaneous sensory receptors the image to your left is a drawing of uh, them still. We can now take our attention to the second organist structure of the skin, and that is the sweat glands. So sweat glands are simple tubular coiled exocrine glands. When you say a gland is simple, it means that uh, the ductal portion is not branched. So it's just one thing. Tubular means that the secretory portion is elongated like a tube. So when you say it has simple tubular gland, it means that the ductal portion, no branching. The secretory portion, elongated tube maybe you need to understand that an exocrine gland usually has a secretory portion which produces the secretion, the primary secretion, and a ductal portion. The ductal portion transport or carries the secretion from the secretory portion to the point of drainage. But as the ductal portion does that, it also perform some exchanges, modification of the primary secretion. So for example, sweat, if sweat is being produced from this secretory portion, if the sweat is moving slowly, a lot of ionic exchange will occur on this sweat until by the time it's pouring on the surface here, the concentration of some things have changed significantly. For example, in particular for sweat, there's usually a lot of absorption of sodium and chloride from the ductal portion. So if it's moving slowly, there'll be a lot of absorption of sodium and chloride from the ductal portion. That means that the sweat that is being deposited into the skin or skin surface will be having less sodium and chloride compared to the one that was initially produced. If that is very slow, it will even affect how much sweat goes to the skin because once you absorb sodium and chloride, you can act easily even also pull water back. And so whatever goes out in the skin would be some other contents. Uh, for example, urea, but be very concentrated if there was enough time for absorption. But if there's no enough time for absorption, 
perhaps the sweat that goes there will have a lot of water and a lot of sodium and chloride as well. Could be part of what makes it lose salt, therefore, if we sweat a lot. Now, I've said much about uh, the secretory and the ductal portion of the sweat glands. The secretory portion of the sweat glands are coiled, which means that they're folded on themselves so many times. These secretory portions are usually located deep in the dermis or in the dermal hypodermal junctions. And uh, if you take a cross section of such a secretory portion or this one, then in 2D, what are we going to see? You're going to see several tubular structures cut in cross section. That's what we histologically see. And so this image here shows you the predominantly the secretory portion of sweat glands and perhaps a few ductal portions of sweat glands, as you can see there. But you can focus on this secretory portion. So these are, they look like several tubular structures cut in cross section. This is a higher magnification of it. And we can see again, several tubular structures cut in cross section. This one also able to determine the ductal portions of them which is also initially coiled before it traverses the dermis and the epidermis. So this secretory portion of sweat glands have two types of sweat glands, sorry, two types of cell types, two types of cells. We have the secretory cells or what we call the acyna cells or the alveolar cells. These are the cells that produce the secretion the primary secretion. Then we have what we call the myoepithelial cells. The myoepithelial cells are the flattened cells on the periphery like that one. The flattened cells on the periphery of the secretory portion. These flattened cells contract to promote excretion of sweat from the secretory portion. This image shows you the secretory cells and just shows you the myoepithelial cells like that one and even that one and that one. So these are the myoepithelial cells. They're the cells whose contraction help to expel sweat from the secretory portion into the ductal portion and of course all the way to the skin. The ductal portion of the sweat glands, as I've already mentioned, traverse the rest of the dermis as well as the epidermis. This one shows you the secretory portion. This is the ductal portion, which traverses the rest of the dermis and epidermis. Then this one, this is the secretory portion. This is the ductal portion, which traverses the rest of the dermis as well as the epidermis. There are two types of sweat glands based on how the ductal portions uh, open and also based on the type of secretions they have. The majority of the sweat glands in humans are termed eccrine sweat glands. The eccrine sweat glands are the type of sweat glands that the ductal portion predominantly open directly onto the skin surface like this one that the majority of the sweat glands in the body, they predominantly produce watery secretion. And this watery secretion is largely for thermoregulation. When this uh, sweat is released into the skin surface, then it evaporates. It will evaporate by also absorbing the latent heat of vaporization from the skin and so that will have a cooling effect on the body. Eccrine sweat glands are found almost all over the body. But there's another type of sweat gland that we call the apocrine sweat glands. The apocrine sweat glands, most of them have their ductal portion opening along the hair follicle. They tend to have a limited distribution. So they are found perhaps in the axilla, the armpits. They also found around the pubic region. You may find them around the areola of the breast. You may find them along the external auditory meters and perhaps you also find them 
in some regions in the eyelids. These apocrine sweat glands tend to have more of a mucoid secretion rather than a watery secretion. The secretions open a long hair follicle. And it is known that this secretion, when acted upon by microorganisms, bacteria, for example, it may produce some characteristic smell that uh, characterize the scent of some human beings, really. Remember, they have limited distributions. They're not found all over the body. OK, now let's look at this slide to understand the histological appearance of sweat glands. So if you think about a 2D image, the part of the sweat gland that you'll most likely capture is the secretory portion and perhaps the initial segment of the ductal portion. You might be lucky to capture the rest of the ductal portion. It will just be a boot eye moment, really. But the one you're very sure of at the secretory portion. So here, we see several tubular structures cut in cross-section, perhaps present in the deep in the dermis as well as in the dermal hypodermal junction. So these are the sweat glands. A higher magnification of that reveal the same thing that we've talked about. So these are the secretory portion, but we can also see some ductal portion. The ductal portion tend to be darker and narrower, as we can see. So these are ductal portions, and these are secretory portions, basically. A higher modification of the same. So this is the secretory portion. Now appreciate the presence of the secretory cells, as well as the myoepithelial cell, which is that one or this one, and that the myoepithelial cell. Remember, the myoepithelial cell are contractile cells. They expel the content, while the secretory cells are the ones that produce the primary secretion. The cells, the duct, the ductal cells, are for ionic um, reabsorption. So they reabsorb substances back to the bloodstream, concentrating sweat. Now we can talk about the pilosebaceous units. A pilosebaceous unit consists of the following. One, hair shaft. So hair shaft is this uh, projection from the skin surface. That filamentous projection from the skin surface is what we call the shaft of hair, or the hair shaft. We also have hair follicle. Hair follicle is a buried component of the hair. So that's the hair follicle. The third component, okay, so this one shows you the shaft and the follicle. The shaft and the follicle. This is a histology image of the skin of the scalp showing us uh, several hair follicles. So that's how hair follicle looks like. And that's the shaft. This is also hair follicle and that's the shaft. Shaft, hair follicle. This still shows you hair follicle deeper within the dermis, basically. But in addition to those two, we also have sebaceous glands. This is a sebaceous gland. The sebaceous glands usually is a cluster of holocrine glands. Uh, there are acinae, which are basically holocrine. When you say that a gland is holocrine, it means that uh, the mode of secretion of this gland is that the gland disintegrates. The cell disintegrates as it releases uh, its secretion. And so sebaceous glands will have a lot of cells with high mitotic potential because basically when a cell secretes its content, the cell, the whole cell disintegrate. So you have to be replacing every now and then. Sebaceous glands usually are found adjacent to the hair follicle, as you can see. So there's a gland, that's another one, that's another one, they're adjacent to hair follicle. Or this one, so this is hair follicle and these are sebaceous glands. Don't confuse them with adipose tissue. 
the main difference between them is that uh, adipose tissue will be larger cells and the nuclei of adipose tissue will be relatively eccentric, um, not within the center. Um, the sebaceous glands will have cells with the nuclear relatively at the center, as you can see. They are smaller cells, but importantly, they exist in cluster and they're adjacent to hair follicle. The fourth component of the palisabaceous unit is the erector pili muscle, which is a bundle of smooth muscle that uh, anchor the hair follicle. The contraction of the erector pili muscle is mediated by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And this contraction causes the hair shaft to stand, causing what you call piloerection an important mechanism in thermoregulation, especially when it's cold. However, the other role of that erector pili muscle is actually to help in expulsion of secretions from the sebaceous glands. When it contracts, it applies pressure on the sebaceous gland. And so sebaceous gland can disintegrate and release its secretion along the hair follicle. So twofold role for the erector pili muscle. One, to cause pyloerection, but two, to promote the secretion of the sebaceous glands. This image shows you that arrangement between the hair, the sebaceous gland, and uh, the pilosebaceous, sorry, the erector pili muscle. The contraction of this erector pili muscle will help this to will help the special gland to release its secretion along the hair follicle. Now notice the attachment. So one end of the erector pili muscle is attached to the hair follicle, and the other end is usually attached to the epidermis. This is still erector pili muscle. It's usually smooth muscle anchoring from the hair follicle to the epidermis. And importantly, in between the hair follicle and the, the muscle, we have the sebaceous glands. The last component of the pilosebaceous unit, which we can add perhaps, is the apocrine sweat glands. These are the sweat glands which open along hair follicle as opposed to opening along, or rather opening directly onto the skin surface. Remember, the eccrine type of sweat gland open largely onto the skin surface directly. The apocrine type of sweat glands open largely along hair follicle. And so it's usually part of the pilosebaceous unit or can be considered part of the pilosebaceous unit. This image shows you basically the sweat glands. And I think we'd already talked about how sweat glands look like different. Uh, or rather tubular structures cut into section in the dermis or in the dermal hypodermal junction. So this is the apocrine type compared to the eccrine type. The apocrine type open along hair follicle. The eccrine type open directly into the skin surface. This image shows you the histological slide to demonstrate the pilosebaceous unit. Uh, but importantly, also notice uh, that uh, the slide of skin. So this is the epidermis, this is the dermis, and this is the hypodermis. In particular, we can see that uh, within the dermis and uh, hypodermis, we can see the palisabashes unit, perhaps at a high location. You see hair follicle cut in cross section there. We see sebaceous glands and we see smooth muscle there. Here, that's the hair follicle. This is sebaceous gland and this is smooth muscle. So basically representing the different components of the pilosebaceous unit. All right. Um, we can now handle the last part of this lecture. So the last part of the lecture is focusing on the female breast. 
uh, not that men don't have breasts, but uh, that uh, perhaps it's more uh, valuable to talk about the anatomy of the female breast. Now, breasts, as we know, are eminences that are present in the anterior chest wall, usually lying within the superficial fascia of the anterior chest wall. The shape of the breast, the size of the breast, vary a lot with the genetics, uh, with the race, with the diet, with age, with parity. So we cannot really say this is a standard size of the breast, or this is the standard shape of the breast. Perhaps some of them actually just, most of them are actually just within normal. So no worry whether small or big, whether pendulous or cone shape or whatever. They're all normal, it just depends on a number of things. They may be hemispherical, they may be conical, they may be variably pendulous. So some are very pendulous, some are slightly pendulous. They could be piriform, which means pyramidal kind of. They could be thin and flattened on the chest wall, or they could be bumping, really. All are considered perhaps normal. In as much as uh, we have that variation, the base of the breast, this is where the breast attaches onto the chest wall, is relatively constant. So what are the extents? of breast attachment on the chest wall. The base of the breast extends from somewhere superior here, corresponding with the level of the second rib, up to down there, corresponding with the level of the sixth rib. So this is the superior extent, second rib, and this is the inferior extent, sixth rib. The middle extent is up to this, age of the sternum, so we can talk about the lateral sternal border. And the lateral extent of the base of the breast is almost at the mid-axillary line. We can just talk about mid-axillary line. Remember, those are the extents of the base. We have the nipple and the surrounding skin, which we call the areolas. The whole thing is called the nipple areola complex. The nipple areola complex consists of the nipple, which is a projection, and the areola, which is a cone or rather a disc of hyperpigmented skin around the nipple. Usually, the nipple areola complex tends to be at the center of the breast, but depending on the redundancy of the breast, perhaps the nipple could sag much down or could be at the center, really. The location is therefore variable and depends on the breast morphology. If this was a very young person, the nipple areola complex will be located at the fourth intercostal space, close to the mid clavicular line. Perhaps for not a very young person, we can consider it still the same if you assume that this woman lies supine and perhaps make sure that the nipple is at the center of the breast. Then in that case, the nipple areola complex will also fall on the fourth intercostal space close to the mid clavicular line. But if this woman stands or sits and the breast sags, then the nipple could be anywhere down. The shape of the nipple also varies and the pro degree of projection of the nipple also varies. Some are very projected, some are flattened on the, on the areola skin, and uh, occasionally we have the inverted ones, which means they never really inverted. That's usually more congenital and has a lot of difficulty with breastfeeding. There are a number of glands which are present on the areola skin. We have some apocrine sweat glands, as I've already mentioned, but we also have some sebaceous glands. The sebaceous glands, which are located around the areola skin, tend to be a bit prominent. Uh, they constitute uh, what we call the tubercles of Montgomery, 
these are basically the prominent sebaceous glands around the areola skin. These sebaceous glands are not necessarily associated with hair follicles, by the way. They are not necessarily associated with hair follicles, but they are present in the areola skin. They are the ones that produce some oily secretion onto the areola skin that is important in making sure that it's lubricated. In terms of general morphology of the breast, we can divide the breast, the female breast, into regions. Now, in terms of describing to region anatomy, there's some three concepts that I want you to be familiar with. One is that we can divide it into a quadrant type of anatomy. The quadrant type of anatomy recognizes four quadrants of the female breast. We can use one vertical line and one horizontal line passing through the nipple to divide the breast into four quadrants. The upper outer quadrant, the upper inner quadrant, the lower inner quadrant, and the lower outer quadrant of the breast. So that's a quadrant anatomy. But we can also talk about the zonal anatomy. The zonal anatomy of the breast tends to divide the breast into three zones, starting from the nipple going outwards radially. So the region near the nipple, nipple areola complex is zone A or zone one. The second third of that region, maybe around that region is zone B or zone two. And the outer third radially, is on C or is on three. So remember, it's a radial away from the nipple. Zone A, the inner one third. Zone B, the middle one third. And zone C, the outer one third radially. So that's the zonal anatomy of the breast. Then we have the o'clock anatomy of the breast. And this is simple. You just know the o'clock. So, but remember that you have to be really specifying in the right breast or the le left breast for that to make much sense. For example, the breast we're looking at here is the right breast of this particular lady. So we know that this is 12 o'clock and this is six o'clock. This is uh, three o'clock and that's nine o'clock. So why do we need to know all this anatomy? We need to know this region and from the breast so that we're able to localize some lesions. For example, if a lesion is present here, where the pointer is, we can localize it. We can say that lesion is in the right breast, upper inner quadrant. In particular, it is in zone B at one o'clock. And if it's somewhere here, so the lesion is in the right breast, lower outer quadrant. It is at, uh, we can go with seven o'clock there, zone C. So, so ideally when you do that, then if somebody else comes to confirm, they go specific latigen and they'll agree with what you said. This is important, especially when we're imaging the breast and perhaps you've done an ultrasound of the breast and you've seen a lesion there. You need to write a report so that the person who is seeing this person next should be able to actually go to where you described and they, see, and they find what you described. So that if they can find something else that in another region, then perhaps it's another lesion, not necessarily the first one. That's why it's important to be pinpointing uh, location, specific locations of breast lesions. Now, the upper outer quadrant of the breast is not limited to that one, but continue way towards the axilla. And that extension of the breast towards the axilla is what we call the axillary tail of the breast. Uh, the person describes called spence, or sometimes it's called the tail of spence. It's the extension of the breast tissue 
from the upper outer quadrant towards the armpit. Uh, the fold below the breast here, this is the inframammary crease. The inframammary crease usually signifies the point of attachment of the superficial fascia to the anterior chest wall. And so it's a bit tough on this side to be holding the breast. Uh, when you look at the floor of the breast, the floor of the breast is where the breast now rests on the anterior chest wall. It lies on the pectoral fascia, but this pectoral fascia separates the posterior surface of the breast from some muscles. So in particular, we have the pectoralis major muscle. We also have the serratus anterior muscle and you have the external oblique muscle or itaponeurosis. You notice I've not indicated pectoralis minor muscle there because usually the breast will not directly rest on pectoralis minor because there'll be separation between, or rather the, the pectoralis major will be intervening between them. So deep to the deep fascia, the breast rest on Pectoralis major, serratus anterior, and external oblique. It doesn't rest on pectoralis minor. Pec minor is deeper to the pectoralis major muscles. Take note. There's a potential space between the breast tissue and uh, the anterior chest wall. This is what we call the retromammary space. This retromammary space allows for some mobility of the female breast on the anterior chest wall. This is an important parameter to check, perhaps when you are evaluating a woman for breast disease, we want to see how mobile are the breasts so that if the mobility changes, then perhaps there could be something going on with that particular breast that needs some more evaluation. In terms of histological structure, the breast consists of about 15 to 20 lobes, which are generally irregular lobes. These irregular lobes are irregular lobes of glandular tissue. The glandular tissue have several ducts which branch, but the branching of the duct end on some end of the duct. Um, the ends of the duct end on some secretory lobules. So for example, here, we can see the ductal system branching highly, branching, branching, then the terminal part of the duct and on some lobule. This end of the duct on some lobule constitute what we call the terminal duct lobular unit of the breast. So this terminal duct lobular unit of the breast consists of the functional milk secreting structure of the breast. The terminal ductal lobular unit consisting of the lobule itself and the duct that drain that lobule. The terminal duct that drain the lobule and the lobule itself. This is the terminal ductal lobular unit. It's the functional unit of the breast. There are several fibrous strands or connective tissue sheets that uh, traverse the breast tissue. So the ones between the lobules are very thin and uh, fine. Then the one between lobes are slightly thicker, uh, classically dense ones. In particular, those ones that are between lobes tend to extend from the deep fascia of the chest, the pectoral fascia, all the way to the subcutaneous tissue, so traversing the breast. Uh, we call them the suspensory ligaments of Cooper. They extend from the deep fascia to the dermis of the skin. The ones which are on the upper part of the breast are particularly strong. And so they're the ones that are helping to hold the breast so that it doesn't sag much down the suspensory ligaments of Cooper. This image shows you maybe perhaps, okay, I'll show it on this one. So this image shows you perhaps uh, 
the different lobules of the breast with the ducts that drain them. And this one shows you how the lobules are organized. The different lobules drain into a duct. So that's the terminal ductal lobular unit of the breast with the function unit of the breast. The different ducts join to form larger duct. The ducts of the breast are termed the lactiferous ducts. So generally, we have several lobules, which means they have several ductal lobular units. The terminal duct that drain each ductal lobular unit join to form larger ducts. These larger ducts will form even larger ducts. And those larger ducts are now present within the connective tissue elements of the breasts, the ones between the lobes. From this, we have about, again, 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts, which open independently into the nipple. Each lobe is drained by a duct, as you can see here. The lactiferous ducts just before they open, they usually have a slight dilatation like that one, and that is called the ampulla, before they just open independently at the nipple. So don't expect to see only one hole at the nipple. Expect to see multiple holes corresponding to the multiple lactiferous ducts. So this is histological structure of the female breast and most likely a lactating type. What do we notice? At this low magnification, we can see that uh, we have connective tissue stroma that extend into the organ and so dividing it into lobules, lobes and lobules. So perhaps that's a connective tissue set up a bit thick. That is a thick divided into lobes and even some smaller ones which divide into lobules. A higher magnification reveal that the connective tissue septa in some regions contain some adipose tissues. You can see these are now adipocytes. So the stromal tissue of the breast usually have fibrous connective tissue, but also has adipose tissue. This stromal tissue of the breast consists of connective tissue framework that uh, divide the breast into lobes and lobules. Then now moving into the parenchymal component, the lobules themselves. The lobules consist of several uh, breast alveoli. They also consist of several ductal system. And in this particular region, we see some ducts within the lobule. So these are the intralobular ducts, the ducts of the breast within the lobule. But we also see some alveoli as well. The alveoli are the ones which are dilated, as you can see here. And the alveoli tend to have just simple cuboidal epithelium and a wider lumen. When you see this several alveoli with simple cuboidal epithelium wider lumen, it most likely tells you that this breast was a lactating type. And we can see there's been some material within the alveoli. If this breast was not lactating, then we'll expect to have collapsed alveoli or not well-developed alveoli. So we only see the ductal portions within the lobule, but we don't see much of the alveolar portions within the lobule. Great, so that is it with regard to that lecture, very long lecture on microscopic organization of the skin and its appendages. As I told you, the lecture on skin, on integument system and thermal regulation is given in three parts. So the first part is what you've done. The second part is more of a physiology aspect, focusing on behavioral and physiological mechanisms of thermal regulation. And the third part will be more of development and congenital malformations of the skin. So thank you very much. We'll stop there for this session.